Barry Coates. I rise to speak at the final reading of the Anti-Money Laundering and Countering Financing of Terrorism Amendment Bill. Um, I wanted to, to first start by saying why this bill is important. I think this is actually one of the most important bills that we've had through Parliament uh, uh, in the term that I've been here uh, since last October. Uh, I think this bill has been far too long in coming. We have to remind ourselves that money laundering is about how criminals hide their money. It's about ways in which illicit money can be washed clean. Um, the police in 2013 estimated that the annual amount of money laundering going on is 1.6 billion, but actually they didn't really know. Uh, and they themselves have put the, order, the estimates uh, at orders of magnitude higher. Um, the money, we need to remind ourselves that the money comes from profits from crime. That means uh, there are real people at the end of this crime. There are people who have been hooked into to pee and other addictive drugs. There are victims of extortion and organised crime, women and children who have uh, been forced into the sex trade. There have been arms dealers and, and corrupt officials. These are some of the people who are hurt by the crime that ends up being laundered in our country. Uh, and we need to remind ourselves of the human cost of money laundering. We've also heard from the police that more than half of the money laundering goes into real estate. Um, what does that mean? Well, there are examples of foreign buyers coming into New Zealand, viewing 50 houses and buying 40. Um, the amount of money laundering that has gone into real estate has fueled our housing bubble, has meant that younger New Zealanders cannot afford to get on to the property ownership ladder. Uh, it has distorted our property market um, because we have not had adequate controls. And the lack of proper legislation uh, has created a financial subset sector that feeds off dirty money. So legislation is obviously been required. Uh, the question is why it's taken so long. Uh, the UK has had similar legislation since 2007. The Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering did an evaluation of New Zealand in 2009. They found 197 cases of money laundering for fraud, drugs, theft, blackmail, burglary. As a result of their report, New Zealand was struck off the EU's whitelist of countries that could be trusted on money laundering. And that added to the costs for New Zealand companies of doing business. The Financial Times called us a soft touch for money laundering. Um, this government, when they came into office, promised action. Um, officials, however, subsequently said that work was deferred due to other priorities. It was only after pressure from the Greens, Labour's, researchers and across business sector that we started to get some recognition uh, that this legislation needed to be brought forward. And then this Sherwin report uh, required or recommended uh, that the legislation be introduced by the end of 2016. Finally, we have legislation before us in this House produced uh, at breakneck speed in the last sessions of Parliament uh, before the end of the session. The Green Party supports this legislation. We have been deeply involved in its formulation. We have engaged closely in the committee process and I've welcomed the constructive process uh, of the chair, uh, Kenraljit Singh Bakshi, uh, and committee colleagues. Um, I think it has been a constructive process and I think through processes such as this we have seen uh, the committee 
acting to reduce compliance costs and make more effective legislation. Um, we have some concerns still about the bill, however. Um, submitters called for three key elements to be included in this bill. They, in our view, were not fully included. Um, the first was that submitters called uh, for the bill to be supported, for the information to be supported by a public register of beneficial owners. Now, this means that the people who had put their money into foreign trusts in New Zealand, the 11,000 foreign trusts that were registered at the time that the Panama Papers broke open this story, uh, that those people would have had to have gone on to a public register showing beneficial ownership. In the end, the government stopped short of that register. They provided a, a far less onerous requirement that instead only names and addresses would be required without beneficial owners. Uh, as a result of even these weak rules, most of the trusts then didn't re-register. 3,000 of the 11,000 trusts were prepared to give this basic information. Uh, that says to us that any assurances that the governments gave that the foreign trust business was entirely legitimate was not correct. That actually it turned out that most of those trusts were in New Zealand because of the secrecy provisions uh, of our foreign trusts. Uh, so we want to see a reg public register of beneficial ownership applied to business, all businesses and trusts in New Zealand. Uh, this is a, a policy that the UK and many other countries internationally have adopted. We regard it as good practice uh, in terms of countering money laundering. A second uh, recommendation uh, was to ensure that there was proper reporting on enforcement. Um, and one of the, th the key areas of enforcement is the link between money laundering and gambling. Uh, we've seen the case of William Yan, um, uh, by the way, a generous political donor. Um, this year, the High Court ordered William Yan to return $42 million from alleged illegal activity that had been laundered in New Zealand. His network and other networks uh, of, of criminals have been based at Sky City. Uh, William Yan gam gambled $293 million in Sky City. Sky City made $23 million profit from that. However, that money was not returned to the public. Uh, so what we see is the incentives for some money launderers uh, to keep on using the institutions that allow them to undertake their money laundering and those very institutions themselves have a financial incentive to allow that activity to continue. Breaking that cycle is absolutely crucial. And we do not believe this legislation goes far enough in breaking that cycle. Um, and I think the third uh, area that we need is we need additional uh, resources in order to be able to implement uh, this uh, um, legislation properly. And that was a point made by several submitters. And the submitters said that it's not just enough to have the legislation. Oh, sorry. I forgot to give the member the call. I was on oh, call. It's not enough to have the le legislation. You need to have the proper enforcement. What we've seen in New Zealand is that there has been far more emphasis on the $40 million uh, uh, of welfare fraud rather than the $4 billion of white-collar crime, um, that one in 20 uh, welfare beneficiaries is investigated, whereas one in 10,000 uh, uh, taxpayers is investigated for fraud. Um, and what we see is 67 per cent of the welfare uh, fraud uh, fraudsters go to prison, where 18 per cent of white-collar criminals do. Um, we have a punitive welfare system and a permissive white-collar crime system. We need to change this. We need to get much more serious about the dirty money uh, in our economy. Uh, the Greens uh, would change this. We would supplement this bill uh, by proper action 
to clean up money in our country and have productive investment and productive economy for the benefit of all. The member's time has expired. Before I call Fletcher Tapata, I, I uh, was involved in a slight interchange uh, with Jonathan Young and the Honourable Ruth Dyson uh, earlier with regard to uh, forms of address in the chamber. Uh, I will refer them to page 224 of McGee, uh, and, and in particular the paragraph headed, Debate in, in the House as a discussion among, among the members of the House present in the chamber. Uh, it goes on to say um, members should address the chair, not the listener. And I would assume that now, that now means the listener and the viewer. Uh, so I think I'm probably the only member of the House who addresses the listener, and certainly not from within the House. Fletcher Tabato. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of New Zealand First.